David, uh, speaking of yeah. lighters, I got these from Amazon. You get 10 of them for like six ninety five. It's a clipper. They're made in Spain and you can re they are refillable. They're and refillable. You can also and you can also change the flint. Oh, you, no can have, you can have also those with a, 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 a pie. Yes, I yeah. have one. Yeah. I'm going to uh, take over the view here for just a second, uh, gentlemen, just because of the starting of the YouTube thing. Hello, YouTube. Um, welcome. If, uh, if you didn't know what you were getting yourself into already, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I'm assuming that you guys all knew uh, why you're here. This is the Virtual Pipe Club, Saturday, November 14th. I'm David Dorian Ross. Um, the accidental founder of the virtual pipe club. And um, today we have a very special guest who will be here shortly. Um, we're, um, working on, oops, hold on a second. I gotta uh, turn that, okay, that's off. Um, and I'm just gonna say a couple words as, uh, as a way of welcome, and then I'm going to get out of here. Um, if you are watching over there on the YouTube channel, Remember that you're welcome to be as much a part of the conversation and the group and the questions and everything as everybody else who's here in Zoom. All you have to do is type in your, um, your comments into the uh, chat and I'm watching and I will see if I, if I can't um, keep track of that and then uh, bring your questions into our speaker. Uh, and everybody else uh, uh, says hello over there. Bill McCullough's over there on YouTube already. Walter, as uh, the, the old dirty piper, I think I think that sounds like such a good name. I'm 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 disappointed that I didn't select that one for myself already. <laughs> <laughs> the old dirty piper is there, um, and so welcome, guys. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, now back to our regularly scheduled program, and for those of you who are watching uh, in the Zoom room here, how you get rid of me is to go up to your upper right-hand corner where it says view, and now click on gallery view or speaker view, and it should get rid of my spotlight, and we'll be back to normal. Um, today, I'm just scrolling here, to make sure I didn't miss him if he came in. Um, we have a, a special guest um, all the way from the far north up in Canada. And um, when he gets here, I'll do my best to give him a decent intro. Um, you might remember him a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Brian Levine on, the uh, guy from uh, Pipes Magazine, and does the Pipes Magazine radio show. And at one point I asked him about investing in pipes, like, the, like are pipes still a, a, a portfolio investment? And he said that there were only two sort of of the younger generation of pipe makers that he would that he would consider to be a good investment. And Michael Parks, our guest today, was one of them. So um, he's well respected in the pipe carving community, and and he's a really terrific guy. So he's coming very soon. There, Tom is here with his smoking jacket. Tom Wolf. Always jealous, Tom, when I see you in that smoking jacket. What are you smoking today, sir? Oh, well, I got myself a Sir Jacopo straight grain Paul. I'm an Paul collector, so uh, what else? <laughs> oh, some jacket. Uh, hi, Tom. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Howdy. And what are you smoking in it, sir? Uh, this is the contest blend that we used in 2019. Uh, it's... Um, the uh, Peter Stockaby Natural Dutch Cavendish, TF301. Good morning, smoke. And um, so it's so it's a Cavendish, you say. So I'm just beginning to understand Cavendish. Okay, well, Cavendish is a process rather than a tobacco. Uh, it's where the tobacco is pressed and steamed, uh, allowing the sugars to come out. Uh, 
normally it's early for Virginia. Sometimes uh, Cavendish will be uh, fire cured and wind up with a toasted black Cavendish that everybody should be familiar with these days. Natural Dutch Cavendish is uh, the original method of steaming and uh, storing an oak cask normally without any flavorings added. Um, I used to smoke um, uh, Truce tobacco, Truce Special Cavendish, but that one has been out of the market for five years now. I just smoked my last pipe a couple weeks ago. So this is my substitute for that. It's another Dutch Cavendish. And I, um, like I said, we had it for the smoking contest and I just fell in love with it. I think I've smoked 15 pounds of this stuff so far. Tom, with this dress, you have to sit in my lounge here. It will be fit perfect. There you go, it would look good. I'm actually thinking about breaking in the um, freehand I got from Abdul Karim with some H.H. Burley. It's a pretty smart looking pipe. I only have a couple freehands, so I'm real selective on them. Is this the first bowl in, in that time? Uh, no, I haven't even lit it yet. I'm thinking about breaking out the H.H. Burley today with it. It's a nice plateau on the shank. Oh, shank is very meaty. That's nice. Well, we have talked about. Uh, 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 to tobacco experiments and uh, uh, I don't know who was it. Uh, I think it was one of our guest speakers who had recommended uh, Latakia with uh, a vanilla flavor. And I have uh, a tendency to uh, test such uh, weird things. And so I have bought these. That is a very good uh, vanilla uh, plant, uh, pure Virginia from DTM, and I will mix it with this. Nightcap. Oh. <laughs> so that will be, will be very interesting. Uh, I will do it tomorrow, and I will uh, tell you how it is uh, worked out, and uh, maybe I can send some uh, uh, samples. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jürgen, uh, nice pipe. Looks very German. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It, uh, I have talked about uh, earlier. It's the uh, Inzian from Bauen. It's one of the Gesteckpfeifen uh, uh, from the Alps. It's a remodel of that design. So what is Gesteck in English? <sighs> that is hard to explain. Oliver, can you help me out? <laughs> no, not. That is a, 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 a very uh, a specific type of pipe. It's um, a pipe which was made uh, from um, the farmers um, in the Alps uh, with uh, Weichsel as a stem, as a special uh, soft wood. And um, they have put on uh, um, uh, clay or uh, porcelain hats on it, which were, were made in mass, mass production in Holland, for, for instance, uh, in the 17th and 18th century. And so they put them together and uh, use materials to smoke a pipe. Um, and, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, most of the time they are very big in the, in the bowl. So you can put a lot of tobacco in it, but it gets uh, terribly hot and smokes not very well. <laughs> and uh, made these out, uh, out of Briere, so you can smoke it. It's uh, from sh uh, uh, the shape is almost the same, and uh, 
It works, it works very well. It's a good smoker. I like it. I had to have these because of the construction for itself. Yeah, it's so unique. I love it. Yes, you find it on the on the website. It's still available. It was not a, uh, a special thing. You can order it. It's uh, not so common and used uh, uh, in, in other parts of uh, the world. But you, you will get it if you if you really want it. And if you have enough money, right? Yes, it's not it's not the cheapest one. It's on the on the uh, uh, higher range uh, in, in in on found uh, pipes. So what is the price point? Come on, buddy. Two hundred fifty uh, euros. It was. It's it's not that expensive if you buy a, a pipe from a, a, a pipe carver and let let make it uh, individual. It is. Um, most of the time uh, much uh, expand, much more expensive. Uh, but uh, for Faun, the normal pipe uh, are yeah, around that up again there. 150 euros. <laughs> Ian's got uh, its granddaddy. Yes, yes, yes that, that, that is a pipe that uh, comes uh, in, 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 in that uh, kind of shape that is a gestick pipe. I was going to say, that's a gestick pipe. <laughs> I got this from my mother-in-law. My wife was born in southern Austria next to Italy yes. and Slovenia. My mother-in-law sourced this. I mean, it's been smoked like crazy, but not by me. <laughs> I don't know. It's obviously secondhand, but it's silver around here. It's, uh, mm -hmm. they've, they're a lot richer than I am, so <laughs> there you go. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to have a helper. <laughs> to uh, smoke that pipe that's that's wild there um by the way i, I took off the uh spotlight again so if you um want to come back to your gallery just click on the um um click on the the uh the other view i don't know what i'm saying here <laughs> i'm over here uh so mua saker uh and Moaz, are you, is that Turkish? Anyway, uh, it says, don't waste the nightcap, Jürgen. He's concerned that you're gonna mix the nightcap with that, um, with, your, um, with your vanilla and waste your nightcap. I know it's hard, it's hard for someone who likes to splend and I like the nightcap. I had a, a heavy Latakia phase in the uh, mid 2000s years and um, I smoked that blend uh, 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 very much and I liked it very well. So I can understand that such a suggestion, but I will try it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was planning on trying something similar. Uh, David, uh, David Reese, um, you know, I, because you're my Perique and Vapor um, go-to guy here. So I, I've been working on, uh, this is the Sutliff Match Elizabethan. So I, I, I tried that out this week and I'm writing a, doing a review on it. Um, but the Perique is, a, a, it's weak Perique in this, in this match. So I thought maybe I would, the, the Virginia's come through very nicely, very nice. And the Perique is a little, so I thought maybe I would do a little Acadian Perique match Elizabethan mix and see if I could beef up the Perique the spice in there just a tiny bit. What do you think? Am I gonna... It's a good idea. Um, I smoked the Elizabethan mixture uh, a, a lot. Um, unfortunately, in Europe, it's not longer available, only in the US. So I know this blend well, but uh, Kohlhaas and Cobb has this uh, uh, remodel of this blend, which I haven't tried. I have to do this. So that's very interesting. Is the um, uh, uh, blend... Uh, uh, the basis blend from uh, 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 as peppery as the original, or is that my uh, uh, lesser? Uh, so I never it, tried either the, uh, the Murray's or the Dunhill um, uh, okay. Elizabethan. So this is um, a, a Sutliff um, okay. match, Elizabethan match okay. or whatever, which I... Uh, oh. So I, I try these out and then I read the reviews and the reviews are not great on it, but 
but it, it uh, actually wasn't that bad. The Elizabethan mixture is uh, normally um, a little bit uh, heavy in, in nicotine content, and it has a peppery note to it. So the Perique get, uh, gets it very um, uh, yeah, würzig, uh, would I say in German, um, spicy. It's a very spicy blend. Well, David, David I, Reed, I what do you think, man? Very well, because I know also the Acadian Perique. This is a very nice uh, uh, vapor blend. I like it too. That will work out. So we shall see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tell us about. Just to prove how rare that word is, Gesteck Five. I have the largest dictionary of the German language, and it's not in there. And this is just volume one. <laughs> My wife is, is a translator, there so there she has to have these dictionaries. <laughs> I know there in Yiddish no what a sh that. is. So <laughs> the same with this work is uh, very difficult because it's not German. It's from South Germany, and those guys uh, don't speak German very well. So maybe this is it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble if you don't stop saying that. <laughs> My wife would say, Scheiß Piefke. I know that your heart is 50% German. I know that. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm keeping my eye on... Um, oh, I, can explain the, I, I can explain the words. Gesteck means from put something else in, in together. So you put it uh, here. You can pull it out and pull it in. And so uh, that is the verb uh, stecken. Uh, put something together. That is the real meaning of that word. Uh, but the word Gesteckpfeife is not a term that you will find in the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> I thought it was stup. That's <laughs> <laughs> that was the word of the, of the day last week uh, because, um, um, uh, because Ernie used that word about mm -hmm. uh, getting high. <laughs> and... Uh, and we had several people say, do you want to explain what stupt means? And I, um, I, I left it alone, but... Uh, Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Caveman81 says, I'm new to pipe smoking. Any advice in regards to a good first tobacco blend? Oh. Normally I take my pipe on canoe trips around England. David, I will respond to you now that I have time for the sadly yeah. question that you asked me. Yeah. I didn't have time to respond. So to me, I had a chance to smoke the Murray, the Dunhill, and I tried this one, only one ounce of that one in, um, in Chicago. To me, the Virginias are alike on most of them, but I remember the Murray one was more citric, citric or citric flavor, and the Perique, it was spicier. This one, the Perique is more fruity. That's the only big difference. And I remember as most of the sad leaf do, they put a little bit of topping casing kind of sweet, more like figgy, raisins and things like that. It's the only difference I've noticed. Um, again, I've never been super big fan of the Elizabethan because it's kind of cigarette tobacco and I'm not big fan of that. Like for example, your beloved uh, Hunted Bookshop they're kind of alike on that. But even though to me it's personally it's not the same copy, not even alike. I like the sad leaf a little bit more because it's less cigarette. -y. It's mm -hmm. more rounder and creamier. And but again, Virginia's are the same, just to summarize. Periques are different. One it was more spicy, the other, and that's the reason why it has more nicotine. And this sad leaf one is more fruity, let's say that way. That I'm looking for, that's a great answer. Thank you. Um, it does sort of um, clear up some questions I had about that, but I'm, but I'm searching for a little bit more of that spice. Like, do you have the original, do you have the original um, or, or, or at least the Scandinavian Dunhill Elizabethan at home? I don't have. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to try to pick some up. Because if you get that, 
I would recommend you to save maybe a, a bowl or two of each, get a couple of corn cobs that you have and smoke it at the same time. And you can compare that. Um, and you will notice, yes, the Virginias are the same. And nicotine is the same. But one is more like citrical and the other one is more fruity. The, um, I, I, I picked these up because there was, um, I think on, um, uh, on cigar, um, pipes and cigars, there was a sale on the bulk on, on these. And so I picked up a, a, a few of these, but um, uh, I haven't, like I said, I haven't tried the, the Dunhill version. So I'm gonna to try to pick that up and make that comparison. Um, I like the- of sales and whatnot. Has anybody gone to EA Carry um, in the past couple of weeks? I only asked because um, apparently they're going out of business, right? And so um, I don't know what it is that they're they're getting rid of. They're, but they're probably going to start selling stuff off fairly soon. I was just curious if anybody's gone there. Hey, David, can we get back to that YouTuber's question about first pipe tobacco? Absolutely. Yes. Caveman. I don't want him to feel, want him to feel left out. Um, well, what's, uh, what recommendation would you make, sir? Uh, I started off on the wrong foot, so I'm not really sure. Uh, everything I've been smoking is pretty, I wouldn't recommend to a newbie. Well, Unless you well, can find uh, some beer, which would be, which be hard. Well, um, uh, talking from my own experience, I would suggest to try different tobaccos, like completely different. Try some Virginias, try some Virginia Perix, try some aromatics, try some uh, English, and just decide uh, which one is right for you. That's how mm -hmm. I uh, started. I smoked all uh, kind of tobaccos, and finally I decided that I'm not aromatic smoker, though there is nothing wrong with aromatics and some people prefer them. You just have to decide uh, which tobacco is right for you. There is no uh, right or wrong answer. It's just a matter of personal preferences. Yeah, I, I was going to go down that same path, um, Dimitri. I... Maybe uh, the Amphora sampler would be a good way to go. Yeah. You yeah, know, I mean, so... you got a bunch of different tobaccos. So, Caveman, if you go to the Mac Baron websites or to any of the places that sell Mac Baron, um, Mac Baron has a line of tobaccos called Amphora, and they actually sell a sampler pack, of, like, what is it, Bud, like five pouches, five, I guess. Or something like that? Yeah. And they've got Virginias, they've got a, a Cavendish, they've got a, um, a Burley. Dark fired. Dark fired. Right. And so it's a, Great way to, and, then, and it's a very affordable line. So you're not going to actually sell, like, um, spend a lot of money trying to um, to figure all that out. But it's a great way to to start sampling. And then, like Dimitri said, so I, it was very so funny. I was just talking about this in my lecture this morning about a principle called the contrast principle. It's like sometimes you, you don't know exactly what you're experiencing, or in, this is a linguistic and a psychological concept, but it's like it perfectly suited to pipe smoking. Like you don't know what you're tasting until you can compare it and contrast it with something else. And then you go, you know, oh, it, it tastes like cigarettes or it tastes like pie, <laughs> you know? Um, Jürgen's smoking something that tastes like, like cookies. Or he will too. Just recommended it's like getting two or three blends that are alike and smoking them or open those at the same time. Why? Because if you smoke Elizabethan today and then some like the sad leaf six years from now, you may mm -hmm. not remember everything. Totally. I can. That's my yeah. tip of I the day. Remember what my oatmeal tasted like this morning. So, let me yeah. just, yeah. guys, let me just throw one thing out. I've been watching you for a couple of months and I really enjoy the program. I started out trying everything and I listened to you guys about a month ago and I bought the Amphora and I tried the Virginia first and I smoked it for about a month 
And I really began to enjoy it. I mean, that's the only way you're going to learn if you smoke it for a little while, what it really tastes like. So I'm going to do that. And I bought several different ones. So I'm going to try like next month, a different one and see how I like it. And I, I've really learned a lot, you know, from that, from that system. And I thank you guys for doing it. I'm really picking up a lot of information from this uh, Zoom meeting. I mean, it's really great. So thanks to everybody. Well, Fred, it's great to have you here, man. And that's a, that's a great point. You know, do not, do not give up on the first bowl of something new. You got to smoke it a couple of times to fully appreciate it. Yeah, and there, I totally there's agree. no race, right? There's there's no rush to yes. having to try all kinds of different tobacco. <clears throat> I mean, that's the other thing. It's like you got all the time in the world to take your time and get to know a, 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 a tobacco or a blend or something like that. You don't don't have to try them all to, and make up your mind right now. It's a journey, you know. Yeah. Also, if you don't like some tobacco on the first try. Uh, smoke it in like different time of day, in different weather, in different kind of pipe, and you might find the right combination. Also, don't limit yourself just to one tobacco producer. Uh, try Virginia from uh, McBaron, try Virginia from Cornell and Deal, uh, try Virginia from Lane Limited, and one of them might be exactly what you like, and the others uh, might be what you don't like, even though it's all Virginia or if it's all English. Like uh, they use a different uh, process, different uh, blending, different proportions of tobaccos, uh, source tobacco from different regions. So just uh, try different ones until you find what you really like. And I agree. Thing to recommend is, guys, do not have 90 blends open at the same time. You're going to get lost. Or even if you guys want to have it because you want to try everything you buy because everybody gets excited, it's more like try by little groups. Try strong Latakias or high Latakias. Try three or four of each. And then you say, oh, from these five, I like these two. And you can put those on your rotation. From these strong Latakias, I like pirate cake and nightcap. You put these two, for instance. Do it by little groups. These are all um, recommendations from people with a lot of pipe smoking experiences. It's, it's Another not suggestion is, is uh, to, and don't read every review, but check out tobacco reviews after you've tried a after particular tried. blend. Yep. Can't yeah, all that. reviews are very subjective. Uh, what one person writes about tobacco, it doesn't mean you'll uh, get the same experience from the same tobacco, just because uh, you perceive uh, things differently. So what one person uh, might uh, consider the best tobacco ever might be something that you really hate and vice versa. So uh, it's good to read reviews. And um, I uh, like to uh, read reviews from, diff uh, from certain people who have a uh, uh, taste similar to mine. Uh, then I, uh, if they say they like it, there is good chance that I like it too. It uh, doesn't guarantee that I like it too, but there is good chance that it will be up to my alley. Yeah, but, to me. Uh, One of the things that uh, uh, my local club, the Seattle Pipe Club does, I, I came up with a while back, and it has twice a year when we have actual real meetings there, the virtual ones. <laughs> we have what I call uh, uh, get rid of your crappy tobacco night. Everybody brings in the tobaccos that they hate, that they bought and they found out that they didn't like, and we just stack them up on a table and anybody can grab what, we, what they want and take it home with. Because somebody may hate a tobacco and another person may love a tobacco. And uh, it, it's a, you know, quite often in, in these club meetings, you'll have people coming in and say, hey, try this, it's a great tobacco. But that night, you know, twice a year, we, Bring it in and say, try this. I absolutely hate it. And one of the tricks we do is that uh, we have a problem with people saying, oh, I just want to try a new uh, pipe bowl. Oh, you just try it out. I said, no, no, no. You don't get the idea. What we do, 
is at the end of the night, if there's any tobacco left on that table, it gets tossed in the trash. So you got a choice. You <laughs> take it off, try it. And if you hate it, six months later, bring it back to the next crappy tobacco. Room. There you go. <laughs> That's like a white elephant gift there. Exactly. <laughs> back to the reviews for just a second. Um, they can be sorted by the number of stars. And uh, one thing that I tried is reading a review of four, three, two, and one stars, and none less. Of course, you can also jo go with Jim Inks and re read all of his. They are, um, and that's because I think that so much of the enjoyment of a particular kind of tobacco depends on your individual chemistry. Right, so, so we all have, that's why one of us is gonna just fall in love with a particular blend, the other person's gonna go, ah, ah, I hate it. Right? It's, it's not so much that one's right and one's wrong, it's, it's that our chemistry is different. So you look for a reviewer who like, seems to have the same chemistry that you do, and then go, okay, so um, if I read their reviews, I'm probably going to agree with them, just because their chemistry, it seems to be the similar. And another thing I recommend is like when you guys open smoking pipes, pipes and cigars, a blend that you want to try, you read all about it. And then at the bottom, they tend to recommend you two or three alike. That's a good, another good suggestion too. Like if you're going to get a scooter, they probably will put uh, flake medallions or bullseye flake. So it gives you an idea what to get, what to compare it to. That's excellent. I had forgotten about that. That's terrific. <clears throat> Uh, David, I have a question for you. Um, I just started smoking the um, uh, uh, vapors and I tried Orlick Gould and Sliced. What would you say that has a little bit more Perique in it than the Orlick Gould and Sliced? I don't want to bump up a whole lot of Perique, but I want a little bit more. Or do you add just a little Perique to it? Uh, Samuel Gavis uh, Cabis mixture, uh, that's, uh, in my opinion, one of the best Virginia Perique uh, blends. Escudo, especially if you uh, be lucky enough to find old Escudo, mm -hmm. which is uh, different from a new one. Uh, Escudo is great. My personal favorite Virginia Perique ever. McClellan 2015 uh, Virginia Perique Flake, but it's very hard to find, but it's, in my opinion, the best Virginia Perique ever made. <laughs> I mean, in answer to what you asked, I always have Luxury Navy Flake on my rotation because mm, you only have too. five, seven percent of Perique. And um, actually, you can actually see here, I always have Arlick all the time myself too. Uh, you can compare those two because they have five, seven percent. If you want to jump onto bigger ones, uh, of course, my beloved Fillmore has 20 percent. Um, I opened a, some exclusive the other day who has or that has 50 percent per week. That's probably too strong for you. Um, what I also recommend you is like on the coins, there are six or seven ones that you can try it at the same time and see which one is more alike, like the Dobbies, um, for example, it's the stronger, darker. Um, in my opinion, the flake medallions tend to bite a little bit, so I won't open it if it has about maybe a year or two, don't open it right away, or try one time and then keep it as it is. Um, definitely, Dimitri say a good one, unless it happened to me, my second team, it was infected with Lakeland, so I had to give it away to a friend mm -hmm. that can happen to you with a uh, Samuel Gawith. St. James, um, it's a really, really good one too from Samuel Gawith. Um, I don't know if you prefer um, uh, flakes or coins or ready rub. Do you have any preference? The, uh, also, uh, the 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 uh, amphora Virginia is a flake that I rub in my hand, and that seems to work very well for me. So I really haven't tried, you know, the coins, 
uh, that much at all. Like I say, I'm really just getting into it. Uh, also, if you want something with more pyrrhic, you can just uh, buy like small amount of pyrrhic mm -hmm. and add it to your tobacco. Uh, like a Cornelian deal, a green latest pyrrhic is really good for blending. It uh, will give you that uh, pyrrhic uh, punch and uh, easy to blend with other tobaccos, especially with the ready rub. Or if uh, you smoke in flake, just rub it and then uh, add a little bit of pyrrhic and uh, mix it together. And that uh, might give you a result you're looking for. You said Cornell and Deal, which one? Which pyrrhic? Uh, uh, Cornell and Deal, a granulated pyrrhic. It okay. uh, comes like in a small pieces. Very, very moist, so uh, it really sticks to all tobacco it gets in contact with. I use it in some of my blends, and uh, I think it's uh, it's very tasty. Uh, it's not good to smoke by itself. It uh, doesn't burn well, but when mixed with other tobaccos, especially with the radio rod, uh, it uh, gives a really good result. Peterson's Deluxe Navy Roll is pretty good, too. Yeah. That's got a little more perique in it. And speaking of that, David, what I did one time with some Virginia is that I went ahead and mixed a little Bayou Morning in it because that's got 25% perique. I mixed that with some of Sutler's 515RC just to see if it would take a little of the perique out. And it was pretty good if you want to add a little perique. Yeah, I was exactly going to suggest that like the Bayou Morning uh, red mm -hmm. and Ribbon if you think it's too strong, you can always get any kind of Virginia, either uh, yellow or red, and keep including and playing with that. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, the Bayou Morning Flake is stronger, even though both has 25%, just because of the fat of the cut. With the flake, they get together and marinate much more than the Bayou Morning by itself. And yeah, what, was the other, by itself. Uh, what was the other Perique beside Bayou Morning? Deluxe Navy Fillmore. Roll. Fillmore? Fillmore by um, GLPs. Okay. And the other one that you just mentioned? I said the Deluxe Navy Roll by Peterson. It was a Dunhill one. Uh, David. Uh, I don't know. I mentioned six or seven. So Okay. You <laughs> said I... Bayou Morning or one other one? Uh, I, was... I mentioned the exclusive, but that one has... 50% of Perique, that's too much. Oh, okay, no, not then, that one. Um, St. James, St. James Flake from uh, Samuel Gawith is a good one. No, the one you just mentioned that you mixed uh, with the 515 or or another Virginia. That was Bayou Morning. Bayou Morning, yeah. Okay. Bayou Morning, you have a flake or, re or ready rub. You have both. Get, get the ready rub. <laughs> and you can buy in bulk. Thank you. I can send you a big list if you want of 10, 20 of them by itself. Or also, like for example, yesterday, I, I opened this one. This one is a vapor with a little touch of dark fire, Kentucky. So. That, that one is uh, quite similar to the um, Hello the Wind. That is also a blend uh, I would recommend if you want more uh, a, a spicy flavor into it. So I'm, I'm keeping my eyes on uh, my email to see if Michael's having difficulty um, getting in. Uh, David Dorian. Yes. Oh, there you are. You wouldn't are. know it from my name, but I am Michael. <laughs> there yeah. you it's are. It's not a trick. Sorry, I was, my wife's computer. I was... I was um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was distracted. I was confused by that, but then I, <laughs> this is so funny. So I just messaged him um, because I, I didn't recognize him. And I said, uh, welcome to the meeting. Um, is this your first time here? But then there was something about it. I was like, but I recognize that face. And uh, like, yeah. it, it, has it been <laughs> that's why. Well, yeah. um, not a trick, as I say. <laughs> well, welcome. Yeah. So, um, let me, let me do a brief introduction um, of our special guest today. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to, to Michael Parks, all the way from uh, the Great White North. Yeah, not um, yet. 
not yet. Not not Soon. yet. It's it's still yeah. the great brown north, uh, as it were. Pretty much getting yeah. cold though. It's starting to. Although I saw someone was in Minnesota. You might be a little colder. There's yeah. There's Peter up there in Minnesota. Um, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to um, put you on the spotlight, which means that you take over everybody else's uh, um, uh, Zoom screen for the time being. Um, but as always, gentlemen, when you have a question or whatever, I'm just here to like keep the flow going. You don't have to ask anybody's permission to ask a question, just jump right on in. If I put everybody on mute, it's only so that the background noise doesn't distract from when Michael's chatting, you can put yourself, you know, turn your microphones back on at any time. And also the guys over there on uh, YouTube who are watching, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of your questions too. So if you have questions for Michael, um, please just jump in and, and ask uh, at any time. So um, Michael Parks was uh, somebody that was introduced to me uh, but curiously, in a way, uh, by several people, uh, not the least of which was Brian Levine, who spoke so highly of you as a as a carver and a, an artisan, and uh, it was really exciting to be able to to invite you to to be our guest speaker today. And I kind of just start off with something really basic with everybody, and that's like, um, so we got an hour. Tell us your life story. That's really that. <laughs> that's where we can go with that. That's where we start, huh? <laughs> Uh, are you serious? You well, you know. Um, yes. Wait, I'll get my card. Here we go. So, we're going to. Uh, um, let me do this for a second, and um, and Great. say uh, we'd love to. This is. Uh, there we go. Does this work? Oh, it's backwards. That one. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Yeah, that was a long time ago. That's probably been my one of my most popular pipes. So how did it get, how did it all start with you? Were, were you uh, growing up in a pipe smoking family? Did you, um, did you do woodworking uh, um, and then transfer over into pipe making? Uh, um, how did this begin? Um, okay, my, my grandfather was a pipe smoker. So, um, something, you know, as, as pipe smokers are, it, he sort of stood out and uh, my whole life growing up, he had pipes and, and this sort of thing. And, and actually at Christmas, we'd go over um, my brothers, I have two brothers. Um, and so the family would go over for Christmas dinners and such. And uh, I was young. I don't know if I was 14. I'm the youngest of my brothers, but um, I don't know if I was 14 and, and grandpa would get us smoking at Christmas <laughs> in the house. <laughs> kind of funny. And so I kind of took to smoking a bit that way, smoked cigars a bit. And, um, oh, not necessarily a, a woodworker per se, not that that was like my calling, but I was, um, I was interested in art and uh, I, I went to art school. So um, back in the day, I guess I haven't really shared this, this part of the story too much, but I used to order wood and try and sell it a bit, but that was about 10 or 15 years ago. And one of the times the mill from uh, Italy included the whole burl, <laughs> which I wasn't exactly excited about because there are a lot of, uh, oh, phytosanitary issues, you know, with getting the wood in and this doesn't exactly pass any of them, but here, there it came, packed in sawdust. So, there's a burl. Anyways, I, um, I bought my first briar in the burl format, so it hadn't been boiled. It wasn't as though it were, were cut and boiled blocks. And uh, I literally got a handsaw and, and started cutting out a block, and from that made one of my, uh, well, one of my first briar pipes was this billiard. I only made two or three. I think the first one I never even really finished. And uh, yeah, entered it into the contest and I got into the magazine and, and that was sort of, that was a real kickstart for me. And seeing the work in the magazine back then in the beginning of pipes and tobaccos, you guys probably remember like the, the Uptown's ads with Conowitz and uh, the, oh, Iversons and you know, the Nords and all the really nice stuff. 
I always found that really appealing. And uh, yeah, I sort of wasn't into fine art exactly. And the mindset of fine art, fine craft more appealed to me. And I sort of shifted and went that way. And how long has that been? Like, like over what span would you say? I am right around 20 years. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I've actually lost count of how many Chicago's it would have been this year. I missed one um, only a few years ago. And then of course this year, but I, I just can't remember. It, it's approaching 20 years. So this is a question yeah. I don't think I've actually asked um, some of our other guests. <clears throat> when I, the artists that I've known in the past have all gone through different phases of their artwork when they've, you know, you know, like Picasso's blue period and then his chartreuse period and whatever, like what, have you experienced that yourself? Like going through different phases of your pipe carving? Mm, actually, absolutely. Um, especially coming out of art school, you know, I was really trying to be creative and trying to make things, oh, I don't know if it was sculptural or new and, and I was trying to do things that way different trying to make things different um and you and received i guess success or you know attention uh, people like that but what happened was essentially I, I i graduated or evolved into mostly classic pipes um going to the pipe shows were really a big a big thing for me i attended a whole bunch in the beginning i would go to three four shows a year actually it was a lot of fun. I'd go, uh, I've been all over, I guess, for the pipe shows, um, not too far south, but, um, you know, Washington and Kansas and St. Louis and Richmond and Chicago, of course, and the Newark show. And oh, I think there's some more as well. Vegas a couple of times. And anyways, from going to the show and there weren't really a lot of makers then I was sort of amongst the first group of newer makers, say. Um, you know, there was, of course, like J.T. Cook and Mike Butera, who even at that time, I think, was partially retired, really. And uh, who else? Uh, there's a couple names I can't. Um, Larry Rausch. But there weren't very many. Um, I think Todd Johnson had started the year before. His, his first Chicago was the year before me. And then Jeff Grasick, I think he was one or two years after. And we were all approximately the same time. Adam Davidson was, was right in there as well, I think, a couple of years, right, when, when Jeff started. And uh, anyways, being at the show and um, being someone who's making pipes, it, it, I received a lot of attention, which was kind of lucky, really, from uh, a lot of the collectors. And as you guys know, there are a lot of super knowledgeable collectors. You know, guys have been collecting Dunhills for 40 years, right? And just they just know so much. And they really appreciate the classic pipes. And I, I started getting requests for more and more classics. So essentially, my work went from, oh, little bits of this and that, and me just trying to find my way and, and making creative things and on and on, to almost exclusively classic pipes, which I've really, I've done a, a, a quite a few in, say, the last 10 years. Yeah, I've been following uh, those uh, uh, Pipe and Tobacco magazine uh, pipe contests uh, throughout the years. And I remember the uh, billiard that was the very first pipe carving contest uh, yeah. hosted by Pipes and Tobaccos. And uh, very few uh, makers um, actually made real billiard. You know, one of the very few who had a real billiard. <laughs> and even mine was sort of close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I remember nobody made perfect billiard, but uh, yours was one of the closest. <laughs> uh, thanks, yeah, yeah. I can't remember who won, actually. I, I'm sure I could fish the magazine out, but I can't remember who won that. I don't remember who won it, but yes, you were right. Mike Butera was one of the judges then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was actually second contest. First uh, contest was uh, just to uh, submit a sketch of a pipe. And <laughs> second contest was a real uh, uh, carving, a pipe carving, and that was billiard, yes. <laughs> yeah. 
So Michael, how many pipes do you make a year? Uh, mm. Not too many. Um, I think it's uh, quite possible I'm slow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I find as, as my craft has improved, I haven't exactly sped up. You know, it's, it's in some ways, a lot of it has slowed down. I guess more time goes into each step of, of making the pipes. Um, I would say 75 at most. There, were, um, there was a span of five years where I had someone working for me full time. I, I started with, I started an apprentice and he would work in the shop and he would work on sort of, well, I would initiate a block and a design and then hand that to him after it was prepared. And he would, he would drill that and then he would get the stem prepared, the tenon fit and these things. And then it'd come back to me. But that, that really didn't continue. Um, you know, I, I suppose in, in a lot of ways, I do prefer how things are now that I, I sort of, I do all stages of the, of the process now. Um, so back then, I think there was maybe a time I, I reached a hundred pipes in, in a year, but not anymore. I would say 60 to 75 really. And it really depends. A sandblast can be 20 hours, 18 to 20 hours, sometimes a little bit more if it's something big or has some accents. But then a smooth can often be um, 35, you know, 25, 35. It, it really depends. And how many of those would are commissions? For, I've been really fortunate. I, I think it's because I started, like I said earlier on, and I really focused on um, making what people wanted. I really focused on commissions, not even intentionally. I just, I just liked it. I liked making pipes for people. And I liked including them in the decision-making process of what they wanted. And then I, I would try to make that as exactly as possible. And that's been really good for me. So as a result of that, I've had commission, a long commission waiting list for a long time. Um, I also have reg, a, a good group of regulars who I make one or two pipes for a year. You know, if I'm only making 60 pipes and, you know, I got to, group of people who get two a year, well, you know, there's not a lot left over. And I, I really have to try to get smoking pipes some from time to time. And yeah, so mostly commissions. Uh, back in those days, I tried, there was, oh, pipe do in Japan. I sold, I used to sell to a few retailers in Japan. I've only sold once to a retailer in China. I sold oh, for a little while to um, the pipe shop in, in Russia, but ultimately, Actually, I saw you had Ernie Quintil Quintiliani. Yeah. Yeah, I, he, he got me uh, selling pipes to Watch City Cigar for a few years, which was really cool. In exchange for a box of cigars a couple times, actually, which was great. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so mostly commissions. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of some questions that are... Um... Re will reveal to a lot of people like what is the, the there is the business side to being a full-time carver or to being a carver of some uh, repute in the in the pipe smoking world right so um it's it's not always like oh i just you know got up on a saturday morning and went in and and made pipes and that's how i'm supporting my family there, there's a business side to this and so i'm curious about this and i it, I want to make sure that you know that you can say that's none of your business <laughs> when we I ask something like that. But I'm curious, like, so you have a website, which is a beautiful website. It's I'm not surprised, given your your fine arts background, how how gorgeous it is there. I again, um, you know, over the years, like uh, the the things that that I've been really lucky with, I, I really believe my website is one of them. That was a guy who contacted me. His name's Patrick Crawford, um, Black Letter Design, and he's based in uh, Columbus, Ohio. I, oh, I forgot to mention Premo at Smokers Haven. I, I sold through Smokers Haven for a, a number of years and worked with Premo. But um, this guy, Patrick, contacted me, and his whole thing was branding. That was his business, and he was into pipes, and he, he just said, you know, he was like, man, you need a better website. I want to make it for you. Let's do this. And I was like, you know, okay, you know, like, how should I pay you? You know? And he's like, well, you should make me pipes. So 
I ended up, uh, my whole website was done in exchange for pipes. It was really cool. Patrick was working in New York a bit and he had a few people with him and they would either drive or fly out or, or what have you. And uh, they made a driving tour. And so they drove from Columbus to here and, and spent a few days here. And all the photography, everything was all Patrick. That's so, it. and essentially I've hardly modified the site from, from its creation. So it really is his image. He did an excellent job. I mean, it's a, it's a compelling website. If you guys haven't been to um, his website, it's parkspipes.com. And um, you can see the gallery of some of his past work on there. It's just, it's, it's stunning. Uh, do, you, do you keep the, the inventory up to date on the website or is that reflective mm. of what you've got to sell? Uh, unfortunately not. Actually, and think as far as things for sale, I, it's not very common that I have anything for sale. It doesn't, it's, it's custom order for almost like almost entirely. It's really quite rare. And if I do get a piece, there are people kind of who I've talked to who I know want something and I'll let them know. Um, but I, I try to keep the galleries well now. I, I have not done a great job of that either. You know, I haven't updated the galleries in I think two years. So I've been collecting like a, a bunch of photos since that do have to go up. The galleries kind of become extensive. They become kind of huge. You know, I've got like a few pages of just billiards, um, for example. So we have a, a question here from the YouTube group. Uh, Forever Where After cool. um, says, do you think that the people who, uh, who get designer pipes from you uh, smoke them or do they just put them in a rack and keep them as collector pieces? Oh man, no, um, for the most part, they are smoked. Um, actually, at the moment, my, my prices aren't up on my website. Uh, again, a, a candid truth here is that sometimes when I ship, I just ship pipes out, one to Vietnam, one to Japan, and then uh, a few into the States. And I have a few more to go next week into the States. And so I just pulled all my prices off the site because I declare them all at a hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I figure it's better safe than sorry. And, you know, <clears throat> um, however, so, you know, a pipe, they can be quite expensive. Um, a, a, like uh, a regular sandblast can be, you know, they start at 750. So like 750 to 1200 sort of is, is a sandblast range from all the shapes to a giant piece. But in that price range and for that kind of pipe, those guys are certainly smoking them. Yeah. Sometimes though, people like again you guys know like people you guys have lots of pipes in your collection right there's some you just like and you keep and you don't smoke and you know how it is everybody's individual that way or you have like Jurgen a gesticka pipe gesticka fiefen what's yeah. a what's a gesticka fiefen <laughs> um oh yeah yeah, yeah. great man right? the gestick pipe this is a model from uh Faun, we discussed uh, earlier on this meeting, it's a, a remodel of a, a pipe uh, from uh, Germany, from southern Germany, the Alps. Um, and it's a real special one. You won't find it in anywhere else in the world. So that is what he mean, means. Gesteck comes from put something together. So you can pull that out. Oh, cool. And normally the, the original ones had uh, clay and porcelain uh, heads on it. Mass production, they put it together. Uh, normally a gestick pipe is something you put on the wall uh, as a decoration item. Right. I've got, um, I have a porcelain, not an entire pipe, but uh, the porcelain bowl. But yes. the diameter has to be an inch and a half and it has to be four inches tall. Like I can't imagine <laughs> who went and fire that up. Ian, are you still, are you still here? Ian? Yes, I am. If you want to throw that one up on the camera again so yes. Michael can see what mm, we're talking I, about. I can't see enormous. it. Yes, the heads were very big and uh, you can uh, smoke almost a day. Ooh, you can put that's nice. uh, the... Now that's a meerschaum. That's a nice one. 
So, um, Michael, what um, materials do you typically, do you stick with briar or do you um, uh, accent or use other materials in your pipes? My, mostly briar pipes. I've made a few morta pipes. I have some morta here and I've worked with meerschaum only a little bit. Um, so yeah, mostly, uh, mostly briar. I suppose people are using olive and strawberry wood from time to time or, or boxwood. Um, I actually had it in, in mind to do a, a calabash one day with like a seven day set of interchangeable bowls of different pipe making, kind of classic pipe making materials. I ordered some pipe stone, which is kind of cool. I came from uh, Indiana, I believe. I was gonna, like, so I'd do a stone bowl and then I'd do a, a boxwood because I've seen like uh, antique French pipes made from boxwood. It's really fine. Um, I have not done that yet though. So yeah, mostly briar. You know. We have a <clears throat> question again from over here on, on YouTube um, about, and this is a very curious question. Um, so you, as you say, you've traveled a bit and you've come to a lot of pipe shows. Um, are there other carvers sort of, and I'm gonna add to his question a little bit, uh, in your generation. So I, I would consider like Tom Eltang maybe to be a, an older generation. Yeah, he's um, not my generation, yeah. In, in your generation, um, like are there other carvers that you hang out with um, that, um, that you consider to be like, um, colleagues or, or other artists, you, I hope that that's coming out uh, understandably. Uh, I would say absolutely. Um, in uh, like at the show, for example, uh, just the show Chicago, which I really, really hope a Chicago or a format of Chicago continues at some point in the future. I think it's really important for the community that coming together. Um, but anyways, at Chicago, um, you know, I share a room with Adam Davidson. I'm, I'm sure you guys know Adam, I would assume from smoking pipes and the pipe maker himself, he does amazing work. And where my table is at Chicago, I've been, you know, next door neighbors to Jeff for you know, a number of years now. And then Ernie Markle is right there as well. And Adam's with Ernie. And then of course, Todd, you know, um, yeah, who else? Brad spent lots of times hanging out with Brad Pullman. He's not necessarily my age exactly, but you know, I would say of generation of Carver, he seemed to, to come back to the scene, you know, around the time that, that we were all working together. Jeff's been one of our guest uh, speakers as well um, before. Uh, so when Brian Levine mentioned his opinion about who is a who is, who is going to make a mark in the industry? He talked about you and Jeff as the two. Mm, that's pretty nice. That's complimentary. Yeah. It's um, nice to get a compliment from Brian. It's usually jokes. <laughs> He's got a good sense of humor. I know, that, yeah. a, a rare, serious moment there. Um, yeah. Guys, listen, uh, I've been talking a lot. Like, what questions do you have for Michael? Is, uh, if you've got any questions or curiosities, just jump in, man. Yeah, please. I've got one for you, uh, Michael. Uh, I was fortunate enough to wind up with one of your uh, uh, pipes from uh, Seattle Pipe Club. You did these back in uh, 2012, I believe, so it's been eight years. Well, but right. this was the first pipe that I had run across that had a uh, Delrin uh, tenon on it. And right. I was just absolutely fascinated with it uh, because it doesn't wind up binding when it's hot. I was wondering how long uh, you've been making them that way and uh, where'd you get the idea of using Delrin? You know, I'm not even sure where the idea came from. Oh, I might've seen them being used. I can't remember. However, once I started using Delrin uh, for the tenons, I didn't, I didn't turn back. Uh, a tendon that's that's cut from just ebonite, they can shift more in the heat too. Whereas the, the Delrin is such a, a suitable material. There's like a slight flexibility to it, but it really holds its shape. So you can fit them a little tighter and then you've always got a, a good fit because really the fits can change with with climate. It's uh, It's amazing. 
I've broken a, quite a number of shanks that way by trying to remove the bit while the pipe is hot and the Delrin doesn't have that problem what a bit. So thanks again. I think they're great pipes. Nice. We, um, we have a, a, a tentative plan uh, imagining that we're going to get the pandemic under control and that next year Chicago will will come back and we're all going to converge on there with our with our our, our cult paraphernalia. <laughs> so hopefully we can go we'll, live. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll be able to to come and hang out in person. Yeah, you can totally do a, a live show. It'd be a great idea. What else, guys? Any other um, thoughts or questions for, for Michael? And, and that includes you guys over there on YouTube. I'm still watching. Yes, I have a question, Michael, for you. Uh, you have talked about your working process. You had one uh, once time uh, apprentice. That is your, also a work process that which uh, Paul Winslow does. He has three uh, workers who did the work for him uh, in front of and they uh, split the work. And what have you made uh, the decision to work uh, by uh, also alone by yourself? Was that uh, a certain uh, circumstance or what made, what have you uh, made that decision? Oh, well, really it was economic, you know, um, just the money. Um, I found that with someone here that I was devoting so much time creating work to keep him busy and then he was always so far ahead of me. I'd always have just so many partially finished pipes for me to work on. Mm. It, it really, I could have used somebody for, for the way that I work and I, I didn't really want to expand in, in any way beyond that. The way that I work, I could have used somebody like him for you know 15 hours a week kind of thing, but it's just not realistic to have a, a skilled laborer for, for that mm. amount of time. Like, Did he okay. go on to start to carve his own pipes? Mm, no, not at all. It wasn't really his interest at all. Like, you know, he smoked a pipe uh, when he was working here. He, he smoked a pipe and that was fine. And But it, no, it wasn't his, his interest that way at all. For him, it really was a job. Yeah. This is very interesting. So this is a question I asked Ernie last week about tobacco blending. Mm -hmm. um, like who are, who's going to be in the next generation? of carvers and blenders. And, and he didn't have a, an apprentice either. He's like. So who, like you're saying, who, who are the next generation of, of carvers? I see, I wouldn't know really about blenders too much. Um, but well, as far as I can tell, like it seems to me that the next generation is, is already fully established. You know, I, I think of uh, Chris Asterio does beautiful work. Um, and Sabina and Martello Pipes, Gustavo in, in Brazil for Martello Pipes. You know, there are three, but maybe they don't count because I think they're already quite established. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. There's a myriad of new pipe makers, really, you know, and, and talk about active on social media. That seems to be really the new, the new forum, the new arena for it. And in so many, you know, these people have like 4,000 followers. <laughs> you know, I don't even know who they are. I've never met them or seen their work before. Yeah. Um, could we talk you into maybe giving us a tour of your, of your uh, studio? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, I have my phone here. Um, how do we do this? Do I just sign on right now or do I have to sign out? You don't have to sign out. Um, what, what I'll do is I'll put, this camera on mute and then the new when you're signing with your phone you can just talk to us through there and walk us around okay um let's see so i just sign on now then yep you have the um the the link um if you have the app and you go to the email where i sent you the, the original link you can just click on the link and it should open it up in your app okay wait a minute this is asking me to sign in join a meeting Meeting ID, virtual pipe club. Let's see, okay, hey, right, there we go. And then what's this? Why should we do a hero dog when joining meeting? Sure, sure. 
Okay, so so now from here, join with Udio. Okay. Yep, I'm letting you in right now. Okay. To hear yeah. others, please join audio. So this, um, you said the audio will be through here? Yep, it's it's joining right now. Okay. I can see it. Now, I wonder if I can turn the camera around on this. Do you know? Hold on one second, let me. So I'm not sure on your phone, if you look at, if, if you tap the screen, other controls will pop up. Take a look and see if there's a, microphone icon with a red line through it. You just tap it with your finger and you'll get audio through your phone. Go. Try that. There it is. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's worked. That's a sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> so what you'll want to do is on your laptop, is turn the volume all the way to zero on your laptop. Okay. How's that? And there we go. <clears throat> now we've got no feedback. You are, um, you're golden, bro. All right, let's see here. So I wonder how, okay. So how's this for volume then, talking? Sounds good to me. Gentlemen, good. what do you think? Can you guys hear him all right? There we go. Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Yeah, it's perfect. OK. I wish that. I wish I could. David, Dorian, did you know if I could um, reverse the camera? Yes, you can. Um, again, um, the little icons on your phone screen are tiny, but there'll be a, like a the two circle arrows kind of um, thing. And um, that just, you know, just like on your regular camera on your phone, it'll turn it to the back camera. Uh, it should be oh. in upper left corner. Uh, there we uh, go. Yep. You found it. Okay. So, yeah, so this is my shop then. There's my heater, very important in Canada. <laughs> so do us a favor and take us through and sort of describe what it is we're looking at. I've got some, uh, some pictures on the wall. These are, oh, you remember the, my card with the, the roots and leaves pipe. This is a, uh, these were the, the references for that. These really cool French turnings, but they're more carvings. Um, oh, I can't remember the man's last name. It's Alain. Uh, anyways, sort of interesting stuff for reference. Oh, sorry about that. This is my, there we go. That's kind of cool. This is, um, man, you guys might know Vernon Vig from New York. He had a self-portrait done, smoking one of my pipes. <laughs> yeah, I know Vernon very well. <laughs> well, Vernon's on my wall. He's right next to my door. This is a card from the Circus Circus Steakhouse in Vegas, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Let's see what else. I got my calendar, of course. Here we go. This was a few years ago in Chicago. You can see uh, there's Jeff and Adam and myself. You guys had Shane on as well, right? Yes, and he'll be back next week as well. Well, there he is, looking happy. These are my pipes. Um, I used to have uh, host barbecues here, and one time somebody asked, what is this, your pipe graveyard? <laughs> it's, uh, they're not necessarily kept in the tidiest. They got a nice meerschaum though. Oh, 
Oh, this is a cool set. Ooh. It's kind of cool. These are Ben Wade's. Nice little set. I hope you don't mind this sort of random show and tell. This is an awesome set. I've never smoked these. Is anybody from France who's, who's here is attending? Check those out, eh? White leather covered pipes. Those are badass. Yeah, well, Vernon Wig, uh, he's expert on on French pipes. <laughs> is he really? Uh, yes, I, he's I uh, always... also, uh, well, you know, he's international lawyer and he traveled to France many times and he's a member of uh, French uh, Pipe Society. <laughs> yeah, I bet he is. I know, yeah, I know he's part of that. Is it the UCL? What is that? Um, UP? The, the, the International Pipe, oh, maybe it's IP. Yeah, uh, he's a uh, founder of uh, United Pipe Clubs of America. He's doctor of pipes. <laughs> right. Mm, somebody gave me these. Got the uh, the Avon aftershave. Nice, nice clay pipe here. And then this is. Well, these are like sort of works in progress of sorts. I, I organize my wood a lot. Like, for example, you know, this, you wouldn't know it from looking, but all of these are, are billiard blocks. You know, these are cross grains. And then I've got the drawings that I prepare. So I have different pipes sort of laid out. I do, I have some here that are, are partially finished. I've put some time into to putting some aside. It's taken a while though. My process is, is different. I um, not, I didn't study with anyone. <clears throat> you know, I know for example, like Todd studied with Tom, right? And I think Jeff studied with Todd actually. And, and they work in more of a, a European way of freehand uh, drilling and shaping, shaping before the bowl is drilled. And I've never approached it that way. I always work more like from a, like, like, from like a machinist's kind of perspective, although I'm not a machinist, but I, uh, I choose my pipe shape and the size, and then I, I square a block using my uh, sander. <clears throat> and the square. And so I ended up with blocks prepared that are sort of like this. So the beauty of my method is consistency, I'd say, and repeatability of, of shapes. All my pictures, I always have a profile shot included when I take the final pictures of the pipes. So if somebody says they like a certain pipe, what I do is I can take that picture and then change the scale of it and just using printouts and measure them. And then I, I use the photo to obtain my measurements <clears throat> and then that transfers to a block. And so things like this, for example, this is kind of similar to a you know classic Dunhill LC, but you can see the, the shaping or the, the drilling is rather complicated right, right here. You know, this is your draw hole, but you don't have a lot of room here and you don't have a lot of room there and it has to go through at the bottom of the mortise here. So with things like that, it's, it's quite specific and, but I can, I can create shapes really well with precision. Whereas if I was doing a freehand, do, making a nice clean drill would be difficult. Here's, here's a block for a bent prince. <clears throat> Let's see here. I guess that goes over there. What else have we got? While you're um, um, taking us to the next place, we have another question over here on, sure. on YouTube. Um, so I'll just read it to you. Bobbing and weaving. Moog Father says, I love your idea of interchangeable bowls. So I ah. have a similar idea for Morta 
a morta squash tomato with a meerschaum bowl. Do you think the contrast would be awesome? What do you think of that? That'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. It's tricky. Um, it's tricky doing any of those sort of reverse cal. Actually, I've never made a reverse calabash, but even with a calabash bowl, it's, it is tricky to do. I happen to be working on some. So here's like, let's see here. So this is a calabash that I've made and it would have, it had the Meerschaum bowl. I don't think I have a photo. Oh, this was an older one. So I, I lined it with something decorative, but you can see how the bowl comes out. Here's another calabash. I happen to be working on, on a calabash right now. And so this is interesting because what I, what I do, the way I make it is I do an uh, initializing say hole here. So it's only drilled to there. And then, well, actually this side's better. It's only drilled to here. And then I'll do a pilot hole and a pilot hole. And then the inside of this, I end up doing by hand. First, I have to turn the rim. And so the way I do that is I, I glue a piece, as you can see, there's a piece glued on the bottom. And then I'll take a dowel and fit it in here. And then the whole works can fit into my lathe, right? The tailstock connects with that bottom piece that's glued on. So I can turn it on the lathe and then I come in the top with a cutter to get the precise fit there. Um, actually, I'll show you here. So I got a, I have a, a pre-turned bowl that I, like I've made this pre-turned and the size isn't established yet. And I'll do the same thing. I'll put a dowel in here. The tail stock will go where my thumb is. And then I can turn this to be a precise fit into there. Thing is, I have to carve this out by hand. And so I, you know, I, I just start carving and shape it out by hand which leaves you with, you know, you have to maintain a consistent wall thickness on both sides. So the, the more to squash tomato with uh, the Meerschaum bowl could be done, but it would probably have to be a good size for the bowl to fit on, but it'd be kind of cool, kind of cool. This, uh, there's gonna be a horn accent and there's my stem, we'll go like this. Do you find yourself making a lot of tools? Um to uh, do the, the work that you do? Yes, uh, uh, little things, little things. Um, oh, here, let me, I'm sorry if I'm moving the camera too much. I'll show you an example. Here's my one lathe. I love this, this is a nice lathe. I actually don't drill on a lathe. I got this super small South Bend, it's a beauty. But it's, it's and then I've got another smaller lathe. I don't drill on, on the lathes, um, but I work on them quite a bit. And to have the two sizes is really nice. Let me see here. I got one of these chucks, but I hardly use it. An example of a tool that I made would be this. So you can see it's just the tape is just holding it onto the spacer, onto the shim. Here. And what this is, is just a dental pick that I've, uh, trying to get that in focus. And it's kind of warped out a little, but I've sharpened the end. And so when I'm doing a bulldog, for example, this gets fit into here and the bulldog pipe is put into here. And that's how I'm cutting the grooves using this dental tool that I've tweaked. That's an example. Very cool. Mm, let me see what else have I got here. When I drill, <clears throat> I'm drilling on a drill press um, and I use end mills quite a bit. 
So I, I'm using center cutting end mills. So it's a flat bottomed mortise. Um, I use the Forstners for pre-drilling, step drilling rather, the chamber. And then the chambers are finished with spade bits. There we go. So these are, these are, are also made by hand. In that I'm not drilling freehand on the lathe, a bit like this works just fine in the drill press. It wouldn't work too well on the lathe freehand. Oh, I got some pipes here. I don't have very many pipes, <clears throat> but this is a nice one, a 1950s Cassell. And then I have an old, a single old Dunhill from the twenties, but it's a little pounded. Let me see. So what's the difference? There may not be one, but what's the difference between those three and that pile that you showed us on your workbench? The, on the your card. Are you saying, what's the difference, sorry, with these pipes? Yeah. How do you mean? Well, um, are there are these representative of the ones you like to smoke more, and the other ones are just kick arounds, or um... Actually, kind of? Yeah, this is my favorite. I just got this one um, at the last Chicago. It's a, a 1920s or 30s Comoy. That's a thumping pipe, in my opinion. Yeah, these are just pipes that have spoken to me, and um, and I've bought. You know the the German pipe. <clears throat> with the, you know, the, the gestick with the, uh, you know, the cherry wood shank and all that. I remember seeing, um, there used to be a website from the Netherlands with really cool and strange antique pipes. And I don't know that it's still up anymore, although you can still find some of the pictures online. They'd have crazy things, crazy, like hard to imagine with like horns. I just can't describe really without any pictures and I don't have any pictures printed out. But I always, a shape that always appealed to me were the, the classic Ulms, the, you know, U-L-M. I believe that's German, isn't it? So I would have, there was one or two for sale I've seen over the years, and I really kicked myself for not, for not buying those. They were pretty cool. I, a beautiful sandblast here. Look at this one. Now this is one of yours. This is one of mine. I'm trying to get the. No, that's not right. There we go. This is a nice blast. This is a Lovat. Yeah, this one turned out very well. Wow. Was there. Uh, do you send? Uh, do you send blast pipes yourself? I do. This is uh, you know, impromptu, my sandblast cover. So there's my compressor. And I have quite a small cabinet. And then that's a, a water collector or uh, more like an air dryer. It, it collects the water. So yes, yes, I sandblast my own pipes here. I use the covers to try and keep the dust somewhat contained. Actually, I just did an Instagram post <clears throat> here. I'm going to move the phone again. <clears throat> With this one, this is a, a church warden. It's a two stem set. The, the stem's pretty cool. So this is going to be a nice. Don't, don't misunderstand our silence here. We're stunned by the beauty. <laughs> Let's see here. I got some uh, some stems that I have finished are here. So here's a nice. Uh, let me see the uh, the lighting is always a trick, huh? There we go. That's a nice material. 
And I use a, a little piece of mother of pearl as my dot. I just glue it in some resin. Gorgeous. Let me see. <clears throat> Here's another nice material. So just as a curiosity, not, not as a comparison in any way, shape or form, Tom made a lot of comments about the importance of the mouthpiece when he uh -huh. makes his pipes. What, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Here's a good example. So, I noticed that um, a lot of makers sometimes make the buttons very, very small. So I can pick this up again here. I don't like to make them too tiny. I make them as small as I can. It's kind of, it's all, it's a, a judgment call, I guess. I make them as small as I can, but uh, I still want them to wear, you know, they're gonna be smoked for a long time and they wear down over time. And then you're, your slot, you need to be really clean. And the fluting, see how the fluting comes back to about there? Mm -hmm. It really contributes to airflow, a nice even air passage, say. This is happens to be the, the stem for this, this clear acrylic one. This one was quite tricky. Let's see if I can pick this up again. I don't know if you can see the panels there. Oh yeah. So this is a, a six, a six sided stem, which becomes tricky to, to maintain the panels all the way and then to cut the button. Is that ebonite? It is. This is a German ebonite from SEM. Yes, yes, I know the, I know the company. There are a few yeah. companies who can provide uh, such a quality and uh, uh, a variety of color. You know, I, I found the colors can be really difficult. Um, I've been a sucker, like a lot of people have for buying them. Not that it was foolish, I just mean I like them so much that I wanted to buy them. But then when you actually go to use them, it's they don't always look on the inside like they look on the outside for one. And then the colors themselves don't, it's hard to match sometimes the rod color to a proper stain. See, this is kind of hard to read. Mm -hmm. It was Tom Eltang who said, uh, I'm sure you've heard the joke that he'll use any color of ebonite on his pipes so long as it's black. <laughs> yes. Yes. I know, I know that. You told that yeah. joke from Henry Ford. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. He said that uh, yeah, uh, yeah. he had a model T in every color. Yeah. Every color you want. Black. Unless... <laughs> So I have all these, but I don't use them all the time. I try and use them sparingly, I'd say. It's turned into a, as much a, a collection <laughs> as it is working material. I think you've got the right idea in that one doing a bevel cut on the end of the material so you can be able to see the layers properly. Yeah, yeah, like this is older ebonite here not SEM, but yeah, you can try and get an idea of the, the feather pattern. The colors are quite popular these days. Oh, this is all taped up. No, uh, it's not worth seeing. Although I use, I would say, well, mostly black again. <clears throat> I, 
I have some very nice blues over here. This blue is fascinating. Mm. There we go. The, this, this is one of my favorite SEM materials. This, it's this blue and sort of cream mixed. Maybe there's black in there. This material looks great. You know, I was saying how <clears throat> I, um, I really made mostly classic pipes for a lot of years. I've started to, to branch out a little more again and uh, approach kind of creative shaping. So here are some blowfish blocks. And these, contrary to um, what I was saying about shaping before drilling, these ones I actually have done some shaping. For the blowfish, it really does make sense to shape the pipe first, if possible. And then I end up gluing on some pieces of wood so that I can clamp it to drill it. <clears throat> yeah, this one's kind of nice. Do you have a favorite shape or, a, or, or does that go through different moods as well? I, you know, yeah, I would say my favorite shape has always been this bent billiard. Here, let me, I, I don't have many of my own pipes. Really, the pipes that I smoke the most are these two. You know, I'm, I'm smoking this one now because it's sort of my fancy pipe. This used to be, but I cracked the shank, unfortunately. But these, these two have been my, uh, my main smokers. The bent billiards for me are great because they're light enough you can clench them. And for working, a straight pipe doesn't, isn't conducive to the kind of work I do. It, uh, you spill ashes all over the place. So I do have prepped out some for myself that I have been meaning to finish. But I have had these prepped out for so many years. Again, another joke, I guess it's the classic, is it adage? You know, the cobbler's shoes or the, the landscaper's garden. I just never seem to find the time to come back into the workshop to finish my own pipes. Well, isn't it a case that you just plain can't afford your own pipes? You know, in a way, I think that is the reality. <laughs> yeah. That is what uh, Bonard always uh, said about his pipes. He only smoked uh, the, the bad ones he wouldn't sell anymore. Exactly. You know, I got some horn to work with here. So for accents, I work with, uh, I work with horn a bit and there's some stabilized woods that I, I find quite nice. I used to work with mammoth ivory, but it's quite unstable and it's, it's becoming difficult. You know, there's like, they're full tr ivory trade bands in some states in the US. I think California is one, for example. And so that includes pre-band ivory as well. And, you know, ancient ivories. They're just, it's a full band. And it's so, and the material itself is quite temperamental. Although I have seen recently Sabina, she uses a, um, a stabilized mammoth ivory that's quite beautiful. So that's something I might look into. Have you tried ivory micarta? No, no, I haven't. That's very I stable and used with uh, a knife making. And it comes out very nice, very nice sheen to it. I have, see, I got, I don't use a lot of Bakelite either. Um, I have this ivory I've used. I don't know if you can see that well. This is uh, celluloid. This was American. And there's a cross cut and a, a cross, I don't know if you can see the cross grain there. This is a, for a stem material, I've used this before. I, I have some Bakelite, but not many. Like, 
and not like that that chunk's kind of interesting i'm not necessarily a fan of bakelite because of the oxidation that occurs which is unavoidable my understanding is this is white you know that's the problem so i can make it white by sanding off the yellow but it'll go back to white one day an interesting one is uh, redmanol i think i've got Another vintage plastic are these red manals. And when you sand them, they actually sand to a clear, uh, translucent green clear color, and then they oxidize red, which I think is a good progression. But I, I don't use too much of that kind of thing. It's mostly people want black or Cumberland or a variation thereof that's that's not too crazy. So I'm okay with that. Yeah. Here, I'm making, uh, so there's like a classic Dunhill panel there's a version I've made at one point, and that's another one I made. That was actually one of the ones in the, the Kansas City Pipe Carvers Contest a, a bunch of years ago had a panel, and that was that made it into the set. I'm doing one now with, uh, and this, this is from the classic Dunhill catalog, these, these printouts. So I'm doing a small one. It'll be a, a panel church warden. Oh, I don't have the stem. The stem length will be, it'll be quite long. Let's kind of see the block there. Yeah, any, uh, any questions, anything else or anything you can, I can show you in particular? Or? Well, I'm fascinated by um, how many you have um, in sort of some some stage of process that um, that obviously took you a while. So how do you prioritize which ones are going to finish? Well, some of those um, some of the first blocks that I showed you that were mapped out that bent prints and uh, that one bent billiard, they had flaws in the bowl. So I just toss them on the shelf with my other bent billiard blocks. So those ones are are, are out, you know. And something that happens if I'm trying to make a smooth, it usually requires two to three bowls roughed out to get the smooth that's the has the right grain free of sand pits and can receive the the color of stain that's that's been requested. So that's one of the reasons why I end up with extras. Um, that group of extras, I've put some time into that this year. Maybe to the chagrin of some of my my waiting customers. I wanted just some in backup. Um, and, you know, it, it happens in my process that I'll drill a bowl and there'll be a flaw. And so then I can show you a good example. That bowl will get set aside, but trying to be as efficient as possible. If so, here's one. Let's see. So a nice uh, bent Dublin, often with a smooth top and a, a diamond shank. And here was, here was the block, which I drilled the bowl. Let's see if you can see the flaw. Mm. Can you see right there it is. So because of that flaw in the bowl, I can't use it. It's just, it's just, I can't. Um, so then I'll take the block, determine that it's still usable. And if you, I've created a line here where I'll cut the top off and I'm gonna make this one day into a bent bulldog with a short saddle stem for smoking pipes or somebody else. So that's how I end up with these extras. This is like years of extras. You know, here's, a, here's an extra. This was a nice, bent Dublin and this is going to be a magnificent sandblast with a smooth top but it was for a set and I needed a, a large smooth and oh, 
I needed a large smooth and this wasn't going to do it. That's, that's what the, this was similar to, a, there's a Costello bent Dublin like this. And so, yeah, it's, uh, that's how they end up on the side. Why there's uh, pipes in, in progress? Well, I've sort of made a mess here. Put these back. I made a, I made a, a blowfish set for someone only a couple years ago. And that's where these came from. I, I wanted to just mess around and, and spend some time making some shapes and see what I came up with. So I took the time to do that and then took the best two and finished the set. Let me put these over here. <clears throat> yeah, see, that's how you treat Parks Pipes right there. <laughs> um, let's see what else. You Actually, this if you is... have any other questions from, from Michael, just pop right in. Here's Michael, the... talk about his uh, staining process or how, what his favorite stains are. I use the, um, the Fibing leathers, leather dyes. And I think I use pretty much the same ones that everybody does. I use medium brown a lot. I use the one black a lot. I use... Um, I use the red, the Cordovan, sometimes the tan. And so that's it. And then I use um, <clears throat> methyl hydrate. So I can apply the stain and then use some methyl hydrate and pull the, pull the color back a bit to create some contrast, especially on the brown. As you can see, I like, I like the references. So this is Bulldogs Rhodesian saucers. And these are just, as you can see, there's, so these are pipes that I've made, but not entirely. These are references for me. These are, this is the shape I call a robust bulldog. And these are my more recent favorites of this shape. This one was really magnificent. I'm not sure if you can see it here. This is a really nice one. Oh, here we go, here we go. The staining process on a smooth is a little different where you're, where I'm, I'm staining and then sanding, uh, like I'm staining the pipe uh, earlier on in the, in the sh final sanding stages. And, um, and then you, you sand it back in, in a, to create the contrast. As you can see, that's how you create this. So around like say 400 grit sandpaper, I'll apply a dark stain, sand it back. And I can see the scratches then when I'm sanding and, and then that, and then when it's done, I'll apply the stain again, and I'll do that for a few grits until I, I get the the finished sort of contrast that I want, and there aren't any scratches there. But for references, oh, I can ask you a question, please. Oh, absolutely! Please shoot away. Hi, uh, my name is Simon. I'm a relatively new uh, pipe maker. I've been going for just about two years now in London, England. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been struggling with bands, um, getting the bands. I, I use a wood lathe. I don't have a metal lathe. Um, and I've been struggling to make bands and adornments with absolutely perfect flat edges to make sure that the joint on the shank or on the stem, wherever the, the adornment is going, is meets it 100%. And uh, any ideas on that? You know, I was talking to somebody. There's a guy in Ontario named Nate Rose. I know he's very active on Instagram and I've been talking to him a bit about, he's newer about making pipes and, and he's sort of in this predicament as well. You know, really, really like the cross slide is, is everything. Yeah, if I'm making, if I'm making an accent, um, let me see if I have an example, but say, okay, but you not necessarily, do you have a, a small machining lathe? I don't have any machining lathe at all. I've just got a traditional wood lathe. I'd really, if, if, if only, or at minimum, like a small one, this is a, I think a seven by 12. So in here, and this is where I, I cut my uh, tenons <laughs> on this and do the stem uh, fluting as well. But an accent, you know, something like this can be turned in this lathe 
And maybe what I would do, see, this isn't, this is just prepped out. So I know what kind of material is there, what, how, how long and what diameter, but um, I'll take this and actually on the other lathe, but it could happen on this one. I'll drill out the through, no, I'll just, I'll, I'll drill a hole through it and I'll glue then say ebonite or delrin, depending. I'll glue it right through. So I'll put this on a mandrel. And once this is on a mandrel, then the draw hole can be drilled out through that. You know, the mortise can be drilled into that and it can be turned and you can get a nice fine shoulder, which here I'll show you. Oh, here's an example right here. So here's one that's, that's been finished. So I put a, a black ebonite ring. This is just a colored ebonite. And then this is horn. And you can see how the mortise is contained within the through dowel. But so it's a, a clean drill. And then it's a perpendicular face, which I can sand very lightly with like 800 grit or something, and maybe use a little bit of tri-poly on a cloth to, to put a, a nice matte finish on. And then I can also turn this precisely and get a precise shoulder there. This piece also using a pin gauge set, if you're familiar with that, metal, metal pins that are uh, in 1000 uh, increments, I can put a pin in here so that I can then go and then chuck it in the lathe. If you can imagine the pins here, that would chuck into the lathe, the tailstock comes here, and then I can cut this tenon and face it so that it then fits in there. And that- Instead of using the pin gauges, could you not put that straight into the jaw? You could, um, although it, you know, it's one of these things. I prefer some sort of pin gauge because of the precision, the softer material. Once you chuck it in the jaw, you're, I prefer to work with the geometry that's sort of permanent on the inside, but you could, it, it doesn't have to be. And so that's a way to make that flush. Um, of interest here, I can show you on this umpal. So when I'm drilling this, you can see, by the way, I don't normally, I guess I don't really call this like key slotting or what have you. I don't normally do that rarely, like only on a shape like this, would I allow that to remain? We won't hold it against you. Yeah, I know. It's one of these <laughs> things because to make the, the drilling work, there's just not enough no, really. to make it work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the way that I make this is... I'm using what's called a, uh, a counter bore. And I actually don't even know what a counter bore is meant for. It's essentially a type of end mill, but it's been, uh, it's got a flat, I don't know if that's a radius, like it's a flat bottomed. It cuts a flat bottom with four blades. And I've had these sharpened, actually they weren't originally flat. I had them sharpened too flat. So when I'm drilling the uh, mortise, I'll go through and, and I'll, I'll drill like a few different sizes because I don't like to use just the first, you know, I don't like to use the final size first because it might be tear out in this. I try and step it up so the, the drill is as clean as possible for the final mortise. But I'll do a couple drills wide enough to take this, uh, uh, whatever you want to call that pin there. And then this is how mm -hmm. I'm making the face if you can see, right? Yes, yeah, so I use um, a Forstner bit, which is pretty much the same kind of thing, but I can do the first face of the uh, shank. But once it beyond would, that, I can't do anything else. But it would really depend yeah. on your Forstner because you see how it's not flat. Like you see how it has the, it, it will create a uh, convex surface because the blade. Oh, well. All right, so the one I use doesn't. Okay. Oh, well then, there you go, yeah. But so I can't do that I'm... with the bands, that's the problem. Um, I mean, I can do one end of the band. If I do the band separately on in the lathe, I can do one end of it. And uh, But once I put try and put that onto the, onto the shank, um, then uh, actually maybe, yeah, but the problem is that you, yeah, the, the bit that you had that you were showing before, what you called the counter bit, counter sink bit. Yeah, counter um, bore. Yeah. 
Counting ball. Okay, maybe that's slightly different to a fourth and a bit. It's the same principle. Uh, it just principle. it's what I found that cuts a flat surface, and it works really well for facing the uh, shank face, and then the stem faces are done on the mini lathe, and so they're perpendicular, and that's how I get a clean fit. Really, I was saying yeah. this to because he's working a wood lathe as well. Um, I was, you know. If there's some, I, I thought I saw them somewhere. If there's some way you can get a cross slide rigged up onto the bed of your wood lathe, it would really make a world of difference. But really, then just if you have access, you know, or could possibly find some sort of wood lathe that would be able to hold what you needed, you know, and have enough space and then the precise, you know, the, the precise cutting that yeah. way. You're because if you're using your hand, I'm I'm not sure how you could do that precisely using your hand. You cannot. No. <laughs> um, I've I've tried them. I mean, I spoke to um, Phil Rivara about it. Um, he's a pipe maker as well, and he's he says that if you do it at an angle, um, so that the outside, if that makes any sense, if you're if you're holding the 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 tool at an angle, and um, so essentially the outside edge is clean. The inside might not be meeting up flat with the band or whatever it is you put to it. So you might actually have a slight hollow, but you won't see that if that makes any sense. If it's um, round, but, if it's a round shank, yes, but like it wouldn't wouldn't work on a on a panel no. square or a diamond shank, of course, or something you know elliptical, you know. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could. I, I really, it, but nothing, you know, when. If you could find a used metal machining lathe, it's got to be the, the ticket because nothing will work as good as a cross slide where the tool is permanently yeah. flat. Yeah. Michael, I have another couple of questions from you. Yeah, I pretty much came to that conclusion. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, David Dorian. What, uh, um, shoot. And by the way, I, I saw, I was waiting for Simon to, um, to see if he would, could make it to the meeting this week because I knew he was going to ask some lathe questions. I, I, <laughs> I Thank was, you, David. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was holding space for for that question. Um, so over on YouTube, um, and this was a, a question I was um, uh, curious about myself. So, are your family members pipe smokers? You said your brothers uh, smoke pipes, um, but uh, your wife or any of the other we didn't talk about whether you have kids or or anything anybody else at home. Are they pipe smokers and do you make pipes for them? Oh, my, well, my, my oldest brother, he has a pipe, but he doesn't smoke it very often. And then the, the brother that's in between, he, he did smoke a bit, but he doesn't anymore. Um, however, my, my wife and I have taken up smoking cigars in the summer, <laughs> which is kind of nice. We'll sit in the backyard and, and she'll smoke a cigar with me. So that's kind of cool. Um, I think that's that's it though. My dad's not a not a smoker. So we are heading towards um, the time when I usually draw the meeting to a bit of a close, um, just because each week we um, try to keep everybody in good graces with the rest of their families, so that we don't keep everybody uh, gone too long. Um, but there's a there's a couple of things that um, we didn't talk about. One of them is um, your, your favorite type of tobacco to smoke. So that, you know, we've seen some of the pipes you're like smoking. What do you smoke in it? I'm mostly a Virginia smoker. Um, Rainer Long Golden Slices is a good one. And actually, oh, here we go. I, I just opened a tin. I've been waiting for a tin of this. The uh, you see that uh, very the, good tobacco. I know oh. it well. The great flake, pure Virginia. You will love it. I, I've tried it. Yeah, here. I let me um. And again, in contrast to my pipe smoking friends and collectors who buy my pipes, I don't have a lot of tobacco. Let me. Uh, but I'll show you what I, I like here. I'm turning my workshop inside out. <laughs> yeah. 
Let me see. My my all time favorite. So I don't have a lot of McClellans anymore. I wish I had known and I would have perhaps picked up a bit more. But um, the McCraney's Red Ribbon has been really my all time favorite over the years. In fact, I made a pipe for Tom McCraney. He's the, the dad. Oh, here we go. Here's Tom. Tom's private reserve. What do we say there? There he is. Although this is unfortunately empty. Um, I made a pipe for, for Tom, <laughs> like a, an LB billiard. And uh, in exchange, he gave me red ribbon, which, you know, looking back, I wish I didn't smoke at all. <laughs> so I, I do like the McClellans. Um, I don't know if my palate is as refined as some people in terms of determining different flavors, because I really am, and I, this is no insult, of the opinion that all McClellans taste the same. But I like it. So there you go. So I figure, though, I have enough McClellans where I can, I've, I've picked up some nice vintage tins. What is this, like an 06? I have enough McClellans I can smoke this maybe like a can a year, and that'll last me for quite a while. Um, Here's, here's one you guys were saying, I don't know how strong this is though, in terms of Perique content, but it's, a lighter that's a good, one. it's not yeah. that lighter. maybe about 5% not lighter. Maybe. I like this though. I mostly smoke Virginia's. Here's the, uh, right. So the, the Rainer, I guess they just say gold. Here we go. This stuff is amazing. I like that a lot. This is pretty good too. I like this stuff. The Freeborg and Traer cut Virginia plug. It's the Wessex. Hey, actually, uh, Shane Ireland gave me this. Apparently it's really quite good. And this is a vintage tin too from uh, 2003. There's a, there's a full Virginia flake there. There's three nuns. So, so Virginia's, I like, I like Virginia's. So we, um, you know, try to uh, ask a bunch of questions, but there's probably always something on, on your mind and from your perspective that we haven't asked yet. So what question would you think uh, we haven't asked that, that you think we should or might be really um, fun to know about in terms of oh, your, your crafting or your whole, uh, your, your pipe making history? You know, I... I, you kind of got me there, David Dorian. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sure. Let's 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 do this. So we've got Simon, and there's several other people in here. Uh, Tim Heineck and, and and a few others who are. Well, Tim, Tim, uh, I saw Tim. Hi, Tim. By the way, Tim yeah. was at my workshop one time. So Michael, good to see you again. What that was um, Tim? Yeah. What tips or words of wisdom or or. Uh, um, things that you would pass along to a, a, a pipe maker um, uh, from your years of wisdom? Actually, um, as you can see, like my collections of pictures, right? And I think that's kind of what I, I learned was, um, was to, to focus on the shape. I think is is the most. I was actually I was saying this recently to to that to Nate Rose, just to, to focus on the shape. It's it's so important these classic shapes to just take time with them. They're really well designed and well proportioned. There's a reason why they're so they're so elegant, you know, and they're these these classic designs that have withstood time, you know. 
because they are they're very, classic <laughs> yeah and they're beautiful like they really are in their own simple way very beautiful and i think that's that's it once you have basic skills down and you know the only way to improve your pipe making i say is to focus on refining the shape because with time like you that'll only improve your skills more you know and so that's why I, I was really quite, I realized now it was quite good how much time I spent working on the classics because I can then flip back to some sort of, you know, asymmetrical blowfish like thing. And, and from there, I just, I'm a stronger carver, you know, I've more, more ability with respect to, to the shapes and, and to looking at the shapes from all different sizes. So I have to say, focus on the shape. You know, and, and classic pipes are a great way to do that. Or even even not like traditional classics, but even sort of the, the crazy Sheratons or the, the GBD uniques, you know? And just, here's a hawk bill, which is difficult to drill. But these catalogs have been great from the Briar Books Press. This is the old BBB one. And these are, these are great. I, I use these references quite a bit. And then my, my Dunhill about smoke with the cover has been removed, but again, this stuff is, is really nice. So yeah, focus on the shape, I would say. Oh, and when you're making pipes for people, like if someone's requested, try and make them what they want. Michael, let me bring you back to your laptop again, because we want to see your handsome mug there um, on, our way, on our way out. Uh, gentlemen, once again, uh, any questions that you have for Michael? This is a great place to jump in. And um, <laughs> we have a comment over here on, on uh, the YouTube. So very typically on our YouTube, um, uh, participants, there's all kinds of questions and, and stuff going back on, uh, back and forth in the in the chat section here. Uh, Central Coast Briar says no one's chatting. It shows how <laughs> interesting this is, and everybody's on the edge of their seat paying attention. You have oh, good, good. <laughs> this has been awesome. So how should I do this? Do I just turn my phone off and when I'm, I'm uh, back? Yeah, just go ahead and phone? turn your phone off. We'll get you back on uh, Zoom. I'll find your. Your picture will spotlight you there again. While you're working on that, I saw I toss in my own Gebepen pipe. I didn't get that name right. That is, but a, that is the real one. That is a Gestick pipe. Gestick, yeah. yeah. And uh, this one's about 40 years old. I used to work in Tinderbox and we had these on display. So there you go. Yes. I've heard nice. the term Tyrolean and uh, regimental pipe also being used for the thing. Yes, yes, that, that, is, that is true. That's beautiful. Well, um, Michael, um, so next week, uh, this is a, a little bit of an announcement for everybody just to let you guys know, but I also want to make this a, 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 an invitation to Michael. Um, so to next week we have Shane Ireland and Jeremy Reeves coming together um, to be uh, our guests, our guest speakers. And they're gonna talk about the, the anniversary of smokingpipes.com. And, and, but the special theme is on pairing um, beverages with your pipes and your tobacco. So I don't uh, know if um, that's interesting to you, but I, I think it would be fascinating. I'm gonna extend the invitation to all of our past guest speakers to come and be a part of this because we're gonna talk about you know, their ideas about what bourbons you should be trying with which tobaccos and which pipes might recommend a, a port wine or something like that. So if you're able and you'd be interested, we'd love to have you come and just kind of hang out with us. And, um, and the, the question I always ask every week is, um, well, not every week, special people. <laughs> Would you come back and be our guest again? Oops, hold on a second. I gotta gotta unmute your your um, your laptop. So you've got on your 
on your laptop, you can go, there we go. I'd love to. Thank you, Dave Dorian. Yeah. Um, I have to say, I find I, I don't drink coffee much anymore. I think we were talking about that. Um, but uh, a cup of coffee I found always went well with a pipe. And with a cigar, I enjoy a beer, actually, because sometimes, you know, I like to smoke a big cigar. It can be a bit heady. And a beer seems to level me out. <laughs> Although, really, for wine and, and for spirits, I always find it's personally a bit strong for tobacco. And they kind of conflict a little. That's my two cents. This will be a really interesting conversation because I think we'll have a pretty wide range of how people, and, you know, as always, I, I uh, position myself as the guy who knows almost nothing about pipes and pipe tobacco. So every week I'm learning so much. I learned from the, our guest speakers like yourself and also from the rest of the guys in the club here because they all you know, have David and Dimitri and, and um, uh, Tim and whatnot have so much um, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, it's always really exciting to be here. Um, so uh, again, gentlemen, we're at that time. I just want to say thank you once again to our special guest speaker. Uh, Michael, it's, it's really great to hang out with you. Um, Thank you so I, I much. Think, Thanks uh, for having me. You know, we've had a lot of um, very nice and, and very well presented, but I, I think I think Michael wins the uh, the most attractive Pipe Carver Award uh, of, of the year here. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so a, a real rock star. There we go. Um, again. Uh, I don't know, man. I saw a picture of Jeff recently on Instagram with his, his like sleeve, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I can't touch it. That guy could bench press me. That's, yeah, that's the sure thing, I'm sure. That's the, David, that's can I squeeze in a quick question? No doubt. Go, go for yeah. it, Simon, go ahead. Um, hi, quick question on the, on the metal lathe. If I do go decide to invest on a metal lathe, um, what would be the minimum throw uh, diameter that you would recommend? I think a 10 inch. 10 inch, okay. I think so, yeah, because 10 will give you five which is pretty okay. good but then you have to come up with I, I know there's a lot of options online for the, the different types of chucks but you need but you can I think maybe on there have to be pipe making forms and such still I haven't frequented that kind of thing in a long time but maybe you can modify a four jaw and just have two jaws in or, or there is some sort of two jaw self-centering chuck that you can get but um I know there's stuff you can find out there if for proper chucking in the event that you want to drill the bowls on. Uh, oh, one second. If you want to be drilling the bowls on the lake. There's a company Thank called you Bison. What's that? There's a company called Bison that makes a self-centering two-jaw chuck. Oh, sweet. Bisons so I, ha are I, I have one. Nice. It, bisons are excellent. I, I've got a small one. A small bison chuck on my small lathe and it's been very good although it's very pricey i've um, i've been using um a two jaw um jaws made by vermont freehand and i just got a kind of an upgraded set from uh Premal cheetah sure um so but those go onto a chuck um i suppose there would be a way of affixing the chuck to a to the one that comes with the metal jaw is there can you just put the whole thing on I, that depends specifically on your lathe, but yeah, the uh, yeah the the chuck bolts to a faceplate, so the headstock has a has a through stock cylinder with a round yeah. flat faceplate, and your chuck bolts on. Um, I depending on what kind of accuracy you want, people use a a measuring tool, a dial indicator, to to make sure that it's as centered as possible. So when it spins, it's in a circle and not like you know, but um, some kind of metal lathe really would make a difference in terms of, okay. yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, um, David. Once again, uh, this is the best, best time of my week. I really appreciate uh, all the time that you guys um, devote to being here in the, in the meetings week by week and the, the, um, the generosity that you have with your time and your knowledge and, um, and the politeness that we always uh, seem to show to our guests. And um, you guys are awesome. So I'm gonna 
I'm going to uh, send us all out the door. The time bell has rung. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. And uh, <laughs> wash your hands, wear your masks, stay safe. And uh, I love you very much. I'll see you guys next week. See you, David.